Um, thank you for coming. I know some of you have come from quite a, a way off, and I, I appreciate that. Robbie Burns in particular, I'd like to say, and his wife, thank you very much for coming over from Ludlow, my old school, and uh, others as well. And I've, I've talked to a few of you before, and I'm happy to, to chat afterwards. These kind of lectures are really tough to give. It's very easy to give my own research in front of a, a specialist audience. And, but to give this kind of general audience is, uh, uh, kind of talk is, is really quite difficult. And I have sweated over it over the last couple of weeks, bringing it up to date. And some of the things I'm going to tell you, I couldn't have told you just 18 months ago, two years ago. So I've tried to bring it right up to date to give you a contemporary view of this field. Having said that, I started this interest with vision and how uh, vision uh, occurs in the eye in 1975 as I was finishing my PhD. And so I've been at it for a, a while. And it's been interesting to see how it develops. And if I'd given this 35 years ago, it would have been ex much different. And, and in fact, I couldn't have given you half of the explanations I'm going to give you now. And what I would have told you is now actually totally out of date and completely wrong. So it may be wrong in the 35 years time, but I won't be here to see that. Okay, so it's a fascination with vision. And uh, at the end, what I'm going to try and do is, is, is see whether nature has taught us something and how we can use what nature has taught us. So light, of course, is, is how we see. And light emanates from the sun. Here's a, a coronal uh, eruptions photographed by Soho recently. And it's the, the kind of light and heat that comes from the sun which keeps us all going. And right from the beginning of, of the food chain here, mint leaves, this is taking the sun and chlorophylls, which are the usual way, and that's most of the way in which uh, light is captured in nature and converted in this case, of course, to uh, carbohydrates, which form part of our diet. But there are lots of other uh, animals around that, that need to uh, receive light and turn them into senses. The octopus, of course, has two very sensitive eyes. It also has light sensors on its tentacles, uh, which is quite an interesting uh, uh, observation. Uh, bacteria as well, some of those can swim towards light, and they obviously go to warmth and light and uh, s food sources. But also, spiders like this, this is this uh, well-known uh, uh, genera of, of, of uh, salicidia jumping spiders, which have actually six eyes around uh, their heads. The two on the anterior median here are the ones that uh, detect where they are, uh, and detect major vision, but these around here allow it to escape predators coming from all around. And we're even now producing a new genre of, uh, uh, of, of animals. This one, these fish have been labeled with green fluorescent proteins, so we're now producing a completely new set of animals, and, and we can see molecules within those. So we're actually tinkering with the biology, using light as a way of identifying specific molecules within that. If we go back, light has obviously been uh, fascinating to, uh, to scientists and to man. L Aristotle said it was nothing of substance. It's indefinable, featureless, and therefore it's pointless to contemplate its nature. <laughs> Plato said that light emanated from the eyes and seized objects um, uh, with its rays. So there have been different views of how light has been uh, uh, perceived. In the 16th century, of course, we came more to a, a scientific founding. Uh, Galileo, in particular, said that light was either simply too fast to measure with existing measure, a method, and that's where he was quite right, of course, or it didn't travel at all and simply was. One of my scientific heroes, the polymath uh, uh, Robert Hooke, who did his work, of course, down on High Street in Oxford, uh, together with Boyle and also John Hooke with microscopy, he postulated that light was a form of waves, and Newton, his arch enemy, of course, who suppressed all of his political ambitions, uh, Newton said it was corpuscular or particle-like. Well, of course, it took um, uh, Dirac at the end of the uh, 1800s to prove that both are right. And light is just part of a wider spectrum of radiation, electromagnetic radiation, that we all know about. Radio waves are over here, TV. Your my mobile phone is working in this range here. Microwaves to heat your food. Infrared, your infrared detector on your TV is in this range, and light is a small range just here, going through to ultraviolet and then X-rays and gamma rays. So light is a very small part of that spectrum, and this is what we see. We don't see rays in these other areas unless we have machines to help us. Light is energy, 
Light has energy, and that's what drives all of these photochemical events. And we can calculate the, the energy associated with the visible spectrum here, and it's about uh, one or two electron volts is what we say. Well, if you take the heat in this room, uh, we have room temperatures about a fortieth of that. So it's quite a powerful form of energy that we need to utilize. So as I say, Hooke said it was in waves. The energy associated with the blue end is stronger than it is at the red end. And this is the kind of visible range that we can usually see. And then we can also consider light as particles. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to go with Newton on this one for what I'm going to say. And if we displace basic particles of electrons from the nucleus, that will produce light for us. And so we're going to think of light in terms of particles and what it will do for us. So to see it, we're looking at electrons emanating from fundamental matter. I found this on the internet and I hadn't uh, quite seen it before. So light is particles and waves at the same time. Newton, of course, he likes symmetry and he had his hue circle and he split it into seven wrongly. And he liked to be symmetrical about all of these things. And he put it together with musical chords at, the se at that time. And when we see an object, it's bombarded with light and it absorbs certain waves and reflects others, and that's the color we see. And because he liked a symmetrical world, he actually thought light was in a circle rather than an extended, uh, ray, uh, an extended range. Also, he invented an extra color, which we uh, don't really have indigo, but he put it in just so that he could match it up with the blue end of the spectrum, as it happens. So the vast majority of color you see around you in, in, in living, uh, uh, living objects is actually probably green. I mean, chlorophyll is the most abundant uh, material on the face of the earth, uh, together with the cellulose, and they're green. But there are lots of other co colored uh, objects as well, and that's what we're going to focus on today. And that's what we need to understand to understand how vision happens. Now, we don't actually uh, assimilate and metabolize lycopene from tomatoes, but it does have this structure. It's a carotene molecule and the electrons interact with these parts of the molecule, giving it its color and characteristic color. I didn't know until I started updating this lecture that most of the carrots that we have in the early days, the medieval times, came to Holland first from the Arab countries, were actually purple. Sainsbury's started to market them, but they weren't very popular, apparently. So through genetic selection, we now uh, eat uh, orange carrots, and the molecule that makes those carrots orange is again a carotene, but these rings are now closed up. Now we can use that. And we can use that because there's an enzyme in us which will break it into two and make this molecule here. And that molecule is what we're going to focus on because it's an unusual molecule that uses light in nature called retinol. Now, in, interestingly, if you have too much of this, you will indeed turn orange. And you ask my wife, who's sitting here, our oldest daughter, who was fed carrots on a regular basis when she was a baby, she started to go a little orange. And that is absolutely right. You accumulate that in your body uh, uh, throughout. Normally, we're not limiting with retinol, and I'll come back to that. Um, but George Wald got the Nobel Prize here in the UK for the discovery of retinol and the characteriz characterization of it. It's not always orange. And I'll come to that because that's quite important for our color vision. It can go all the way from the blue end, purple end, right the way to the yellow end. And that's because of the way in which those particles, those photons, interact with these electrons. And you need to understand that before one can understand how we use it. So let's start this kind of journey right here in archaebacteria, which separated from the rest of living uh, forms in about three and a half billion years ago, but interestingly, the salt-loving microbes, which I'm going to talk about, they actually evolved quite late on, around 250 million years ago. This is around the Triassic period when salt beds were being laid down on the surface of the Earth, and there's a tremendous controversy about whether uh, these salt-living bacteria appear in these, because we know when they were laid down, or they don't. So did they precede or not the salt beds? But certainly they're in marine environments, and the, 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 the uh, interesting uh, observation is that when you go to these salt reclamation beds, you've got an artist's palette full of um, uh, different colors uh, within you know, anything from purple through to pinks, oranges, and so on. And these are actually in San Francisco. And if you fly into San Francisco, in particular late summer, you can see these all dotted around Oakland Bay. So it's in these that these salt-leaving bacteria are. So here is uh, very purple beds indeed, 
And if we now go down inside these, what we find that makes them purple are these salt-loving salt halophilic archaea. And they uh, are very dense within this environment, and the thing that makes them purple are these purple patches. So they actually have purple patches, and they grow in anaerobic, no oxygen conditions, and in the presence of sunlight. So this is what they look like. Here is a, a real bacterium. Uh, this happens to be Bolivian uh, salt clake. And the, the, the aspect of those purple patches, which is of interest, is this particular protein embedded in the outer membrane of this uh, bacterium. And it's this structure that was resolved in 1975 uh, by Richard Henderson and Nigel Unwin at Cambridge, and uh, a colleague of mine, another graduate student, and I, Jeff Neal, we drew out the structure of this from the paper on glass plates so that we could look at it. We were so fascinated by it, we just started doing that one weekend, and we went right through the weekend until we'd reconstructed this, the very first type of uh, protein of, of its type. So what makes it purple? It's actually the retinal, which is embedded within these rigid helical bundles. And uh, interestingly, it's purple in these bacteria. I've got some of it here, and I'm going to pass it around. People can have a look. It's quite safe. It's not dangerous. There's one purple and one blue, and they can change color depending upon uh, just the acidity or the alkalinity of the solution. If you take the retinol out of this protein, as we can, then it's just a colorless protein. But this retinol is really quite fascinating. Here are other um, uh, environments in, in which uh, retinal, uh, rich Halobacterium halobium, the, the archaea, is found. This is actually an animal hide. When animal hides are taken off animals, in particular in, in, in hot countries, they will cover the hides in salt. And they do that to prevent the growth of Staphylococcus to destroy the fiber of the leather. If you do that and you start shipping as a commodity, and that's often how uh, leather is shipped from these countries, Argentina in particular, Australia, India, then after about five weeks, if you've used marine salt, the bacteria starts to grow. And that means that the leather itself will be reduced in quality, and several tens of millions of pounds a year are lost because of the reduction in the quality of the leather because of this particular um, odd bacterium. And it is an odd, unusual bacterium. We did some work, or I did some work with the British Leather Corporation on this. And in fact, now it's recommended that rock salt, which doesn't have the bacterium in, is used to preserve uh, leather. Other places, this is now a delicate essence. This is an Australian pink salt from the Murray River. And it's pink because of the bacterium. But because it's pink, it gets a premium, and it costs about 10 times more than regular salt. But I think it's just got a cachet at the moment. If any of you are going off to Scandinavia over the summer, there's a ritual of eating these uh, fermented herring, which are, taste pretty horrible, but normally washed down with very strong alcohol. But if you look at any food that's preserved in salt, you will probably find bits of uh, uh, parts of, uh, of these halobacterium, and you'll find little purple patches within the bottle. They're totally harmless to us. They're non-pathogenic, so you're quite easy. You're quite uh, at liberty to eat them. It not, won't do you any good whatsoever. And the best antibiotic against these, because they live in high salt, is water, simply water. They just explode, and they're useless and, and, and non-viable. So what is it about this? Here's this protein I mentioned, the bacteriodopsin. Here is the retinal, which is the unusual uh, colored molecule that we're, we're looking at. And here is the retinal chemistry here. And it's linked into the protein by a particular amino acid, which makes up this uh, rather large protein. And note that there is a positive charge here. We all know about charges. Things can be positive or negative. So there's a positive charge on here. If light hits retinal, it will change its form. And in solution, just in a, a, a solvent, it can go into many, many forms. But in the protein, very specifically, it goes from this straight, which we call trans isomer, into this, which is a 13 cis isomer. In other words, around this bond here, the molecule has bent. So light in the dark is like this. Light hits it, does that. So it's a relatively small change like that in the, in, in, in the molecule. But we've turned light energy now into mechanical energy. And here is another representation of it, and these are the, the residues, that the, the kind of carbon atoms that are involved in that particular, uh, particular event. You've got this positive charge here, which is now moved down to a different part of the protein. And you've got a little cartoon here, as light comes along, it's straight, 
and it just bends. The fascinating thing for me is this happens in femtoseconds. Okay, it's that much of a second, okay? And it's typically around one with 13 zeros on it, which is incredibly fast indeed. And I'll come back to how man is trying to match that kind of speed. Even the slowest rate is three picoseconds. One picosecond is 10 to the t minus 12th of a second. These changes are staggeringly fast. So biology has managed to capture light very quickly in a specific environment and turn it into mechanical energy. Okay, so what happens in the protein? When this molecule is now in the protein, and this is some work we published uh, in a relatively high-profile journal, uh, the best part of, uh, what, 20, uh, 15 years ago now, using the methodology I've developed here in Oxford, and here is the retinal extended and inside the protein. So how does that respond when we hit it with light? This will turn to cis, this uh, hydrogen plus will come down and it will move to another group. So there's the light, there's the change, and here comes the proton. So you're taking charge from one place to another. Only about 2 or 3 nan uh, 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 nanometers, which is quite a small distance, but it's enough when, the when it, this goes through a, a cycle, a colored cycle, to now split water into two components, two charged components. So here is the protein, here we have our positive charge, and if we can move that from here to here, then we're creating electricity. And that's exactly what happens. So now we are get, getting flowing positive charges produce a, producing about 150 millivolts across that membrane, which is about the potential you have across all of your membranes in your body. So we've taken light to mechanical energy in this protein to electricity. And in fact, this is solar power and it's about 60% efficient of the light that is incident on this protein. 60% capture of the photon energy is staggeringly efficient, okay? That, that is really very high. And I'll come back to other values for man-made devices shortly. And it's all happening within those kind of timescales of, um, <clears throat> in fact, microseconds to, to picoseconds. So this is what we've learned from looking at Halobacterium holobium and looking at the salt-loving bacterium and looking at the retinal uh, within uh, this environment. And that's kind of what we knew and we thought that this was the way it might happen in the eye. And then, of course, uh, the, the field progressed. This is, uh, some of this is relatively new. These structures, in fact, from the crystal structure only appeared 10 years ago, some of the high-resolution ones. And we resolved this, obviously, before the crystallography. Let's go to animals now. And this is convergent evolution, of course. We're nowhere near Archaea anymore. We diverted from this particular branch of uh, life three and a half billion years ago. And we're now right the way up here, and we're right the way into animals about 500 million years ago. How have animals now taken retinal and used that for light? Well, we've been fascinated by the eye, of course, and uh, man has been fascinated by how, how the eye works. We know the different um, uh, components of the eye, and what we really need to look at is the back of the eye here and to see how light is received by that and then turned into a brain impulse. So the optic nerve is here, that's your blind spot, we all know about that. We've got the fovea here, which is where most of our color vision is, and the eye is about three and a half centimeters uh, across. Now, when I give the lectures to the undergraduates and those of you here who I've lectured to, I normally ask people to put their hand up if they have cut up a cow's eye. Have you dissected a cow's eye? Now, I used to do that at schools around Oxford um, and show students the eye, open it up, look inside, look at the way in which the retina starts off being, by being red and then changes colour. Sadly, health and safety has now uh, taken over and it's, not, uh, uh, it, it, it's unfortunately not allowed so much anymore and the number of hands going up is decreasing year by year. And I think that's a shame. I do think that's a shame. But it is a neural tissue and, of course, there are worries about health and safety. Also, the vegetarians worry about cutting an eye up, which I'm also quite surprised about. But anyway, I don't see why they should. <laughs> so this is the eye. And... Uh, uh, different people have said different things. This uh, Islamic uh, observer said the eye is like a mirror and the visible object is like the thing reflected in the mirror. It's actually quite perceptive because the back of the eye is actually quite silvered around what's called the pigment epithelium. 
Vesuvius realized that vision is a complicated process that requires both the eye and the brain working together. And that this was uh, early in the century um, uh, before Hooke and, and Boyle, of course. Darwin had a problem. Darwin had a real problem because he virtually ignored the eye in the origin of the species. He couldn't find evolutionary eyes. He didn't know about the, the octopus. He didn't know about uh, the jumping spider and so on. And he actually put it in this kind of addendum to the origin of species, which he called the organs of extreme perfection and complication. And he simply said, how a nerve comes to be sensitive to light hardly concerns us that more than how life itself uh, originated. I would have thought he'd have been concerned with that too. But anyway, that's the way he described it in the origin of species. So here's the eye. It's to the back of the eye that we're going to go. And if we cut this eye uh, across, um, we have the lens and the cornea and so on. And now we have the retina at the back here. And it's this back part of the eye which is of some interest at the physiological level. Here is an electron micrograph. So now this is what your eye looks like, if you could look at it under an electron microscope. And you're probably all well aware of these rod cells that are sitting here in the back of the eye. And unusually in vertebrates, that's us, light uh, approaches uh, the rods from the back. So these rods are actually fa facing away from the, the vision. Your rods are to the back of your head. You've got about 120 million of these rods in a retina, and they provide what's called scotopic vision. That means low light vision. Um, and they, they, they kick in when the level of light gets rather low, and the cones are for bright and for color. I'll come to those in a second. But they can't distinguish color in, in, in these uh, particular uh, uh, cells. It's only light or no light. They can be bleached. And for those of you who know your Bible, Saul on the road to Damascus, of course, was blinded by a flash of light and then was blind for, for, for three days. And you may well have had the same kind of experience if you've all of a sudden had a flash in your eyes. You can actually have your rods bleached, but your, light, your eyes, well, your, your vision, I hope, comes back again. And the interesting thing is that it's a very dynamic organ. During the course of this lecture, you will lose about 150 of the discs which make up the end of one of these rods. About 100 to 150 will drop off the end of each of your rods. And they will be floating around in your vitreous humor, and they'll be taken back up and reprocessed by your body. And that is one of the reasons why the eye is so dynamically sensitive. You're dynamically sensitive over a very wide range of light, because if you bleach some of these, you just make some more. And if it's too dark, then you continue to make many more. And if it's very light, you make less because you don't need them. And that's the way biology can adjust to light levels. These rods contain, at the end, they're a very unusual cell. They're very highly differentiated. And these disks are like pitta breads, literally like pitta beds, breads, stacked up with about 2,000 in one, encased by this outer membrane, uh, which keeps them all together. There are some other scaffolding proteins in there, but they essentially maintain that in the form it is. And light hits these uh, disks, and they hit this protein, and you will recognize immediately that it looks like bacteriodopsin. There's no evolutionary uh, connection whatsoever, interestingly, but it does still have seven of these transmembrane helices, we call them, or rods. In fact, the biggest family of proteins in you are seven transmembrane helix proteins. And about 95% of drugs act on just 5% of those. You've got about 800 in you, different ones. So the drug industry is, at the moment, uh, uh, driving drug design towards this kind of particular protein. They're involved in all sorts of neurological functions, and uh, we are working on one of these that's implicated in Parkinson's and also uh, dopamine release and obesity control, and has just been found a couple of years ago to be a marker for colon cancer. So we work on one of these uh, in the lab that is uh, related to this one in the eye, which is called rhodopsin. But this particular protein then, inside it, as you can see here, is our old friend retinol. It's our old friend retinol, and this time you can probably see that it's slightly differently structured. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So the whole encasement for this rod cell ends here at what's called a synaptic ending, and that's what's connected to the optic nerve, and it's that which goes to your brain. So the signal 
about light or colour is actually transmitted through this membrane and then goes off to the brain. And that's quite a complicated area of science as well. Particular diseases of vision, for example, uh, night blindness. Um, here is the meaning of, of night blindness and here is the, uh, the, the medical word for, for it, uh, nyctopalopia. And it's a symptom of severe eye diseases and there are many, uh, many eye diseases which contribute to, to, to night blindness. Uh, blindness. And it may well be from birth in some people, and it never gets rectified, or due to, due to injury. It could be as a deficiency, a result of a deficiency in the retinol I've been talking to you about, or vitamin A. But in our diets, that's not normally the case. It's very, very unusual to have a deficiency of vitamin A, and there's no need for supplements whatsoever. Regardless of what your grandmother told you about eating carrots and seeing at night, it is a myth in the, in, in the majority of cases. But about 250,000 uh, children, children in underdeveloped countries do die annually as a result of the lack of retinol or vitamin A, which is what it's called. Cornelius Celsus was made an interesting observation in about 30 AD, and he said that su for success, sufferers should anoint their eyeballs with the stuff dripping from a liver whilst roasting, preferably of a he-goat, or failing that of a she-goat, as well, as, as well, they should eat some of the liver itself, which was very perceptive indeed, because the liver is where you store your retinol. And so if you ate some of this, it could cure some cases of night blindness. So that was really very perceptive at that time. Okay, so here we are, we have uh, the, the, the rods, and I'm uh, going to focus just for, for a moment or two on the cones, which you also know about. You've got a lot less of those, you've got about six and a half million cones in your retina, uh, and that allows us to, to receive colour and bright light. So there's a lot less than there are of um, uh, rods for the dark light. And just by changing the chemistry around the retinol, this is for the blue, the green, and the red cones, these proteins now change the color of retinol so they become sensitive to different colors. And that's quite important. We can detect color. The rods detect in the, uh, they absorb in the green area. That's why they look red. And as I say, if you cut a cow's, eyes open and, uh, a cow's eye open and you look at the retina, it will start off being quite red. And then as time goes on, it goes orange and then yellow and then white. In fact, as the retina, as the rhodopsin comes out of all of these proteins. So we have colour detection capability. So <clears throat> there are three sets of cones, as I said, for colouring the different wavelengths, for, for detecting the different colours uh, and the different wavelengths. Cats and dogs have two sets of cones. They actually see in greys, yellows and blues. And uh, they have many more rods than humans, as you might expect, because they have to see at night. Honeybees and butterflies their true colour vision extends into the ultraviolet where we can't see. So they can see things we can't see. And coral reef fish, they have the full spectrum right the way through the visible part of the spectrum. And of course, the bright colours have been developed. And these squid and octopus, they have an unusual arrangement of uh, rods uh, uh, because they have the rods lying in one direction, but then at 90 degrees to them in the back of the eye. Here is a cutaway diagram of them. Here's actually an electron microscope picture. And the reason that they have two sets of rods at 90 degrees to each other is because they can see, it allows them to see polarized light. So they actually detect direction because their rods are in two different directions. And so when they're down at the bottom of the ocean, these uh, cephalopods and so on, they, they are able to uh, pick up light and then direct in, uh, with respect to normally where the sun is. And the migratory paths of all of these things, although a mystery for many of them, is determined by this ability to detect two different orientations of polarized light. So here is a rod, outer segment I showed you. Here is the um, protein, this protein, rhodopsin. Here's the origin, the Greek origin, the name, rhoda meaning rose, opsis meaning sight. So the rhodopsin is the name of this particular protein, and it's rhodopsin in us. The previous one was bacteriodopsin. And here's the retinal molecule, which is embedded within, within it. And the structure of this was resolved only uh, about 10 years ago, in fact, just 10 years ago. Um, some uh, retinal conditions, retinitis pigmentosa, for example, is, is a range of diseases, but they are related to just 
individual point mutations or point changes within this particular protein and some of them uh, just cannot be rectified. If we ever get to the stage of um, really being successful at gene therapy, then there is hope, of course, for those blind people to regain their sight if we could go back and replace uh, authentic proteins. This is red eye caused by a camera, and normally, of course, an ophthalmologist would look to the back of your eye to look at the state of your retina, but this is normally caused by the blood, of course, that's circulating through your retina, not through the retina itself. So here we are. Here's a retinal again, and now you will recognize that this is actually bent much more than it was in bacteriodopsin. In fact, in bacteriodopsin, the bacterial system in the archaea, it was all trans in the dark and got kinked in the light. In your eye, in the dark, it starts off kinked. And the kink is very important. It's not here now, as it was in bacteriodopsin. It's right here, further along the chain. And that's very, very important. As I said, if you take this molecule and put it into a solution and expose light to it, just in organic solvent or water, um, you will find it will form many, many different forms. All of these will bend. But in the protein, it's a very highly specific um, uh, orientation governed by the chemistry. Now the molecule is much more bent up. In fact, it's not just that kind of change, it's actually that. It's a huge change. But when you hit this molecule with light in the rhodopsin, in your protein, it immediately becomes extended. It springs out to a long, a long extended form um, on uh, light incidence. And this is happening again in these extremely fast time scales of 1 and 12 noughts of a second. And so it's happening very quickly uh, indeed. And again, we are producing a mechanical force due to light hitting this small molecule. So another one of our contributions, and this was just a month before the crystal structure was produced of that protein, we, by our methodologies, without knowing the crystal structure, determined the structure of the retinal within the protein. And we can do that with our methods and for drugs, which is one of the things we're doing at the moment, without the knowledge of the protein itself. So here is the retinal. Again, it's hooked up to one of the rigid rods, the helix of rhodopsin here, and it's constrained quite tightly at this end, and it's constrained tightly at this end within um, uh, some uh, binding pocket and residues of the protein. So you've constrained this, this spring. Now what we showed, which had not been known before, was that this molecule, if you look from the top, is actually very highly bent. And everything that's been said before suggested it was not bent. You can't do that to the chemist. The chemist will tell you you cannot bend this structure because it's got all these double bonds and it's got all these constraints that we know about chemically. But in the protein, that happens. The protein is that powerful. In fact, for those of you who want to know the numbers, it's storing 36 kilocalories per mole uh, on that isomerization by putting this in here. So it's a lot of energy in here. So this is a spring. It's loaded. In the dark, this protein has a loaded spring inside it. In fact, it's you know, really constrained, if you like, like this, ready to flip, ready to go. And now, as you hit it with light, the molecule, as I showed you, becomes completely extended. So it undergoes a large change with respect to the size of the protein. In fact, this end moves up and down by about 0.4 to 0.5 nanometers. Doesn't sound a lot maybe to you. It's a nano switch again and moves out. But within the protein, that has dramatic effects. And here again, it's become relaxed. This is looking from the top. This is looking from the side. And you can imagine that if you've now constrained the molecule at both ends, it's going to push this particular part of the protein out. And that's exactly what it does. It pushes the protein so that it goes through a conformational change. And that's happening within these very fast time scales. So, let's have a look what that does. Here is our rhodopsin molecule sitting in one of our discs, our pitta breads. Light is going to come and hit that protein. And as that protein undergoes this change, this structural change, there is part of this protein which is opened up and revealed to talk to another protein, interestingly called transducing, because it's, transduci it's transducing a sig signal. In a complicated set of uh, interactions, this particular protein will talk to another set of proteins, and this is how biology works, it's quite complicated, and it will now talk to this protein and tell it to do something. And what it tells it to do is to work on these little molecules, and these are usually just very small molecules indeed, but it's been expanded to show it, and switch this off. 
And what this is, which is sitting in the outside of here and linked to the optic nerve, this is our electrical conductor. It's a switch. It switches on and off electricity across the plasma membrane. In this case, not run by protons as before, but by sodium ions. So, light's going to hit the protein, talk to these proteins, talk to these proteins, and switch off the electricity so it sends an electrical impulse all the way through to the visual cortex in the brain. And that's precisely how it happens. So here's a kind of movie of that, a kind of cartoon movie. Here comes the light, lights it up, talks to that one, talks to that one, talks to that and closes that. You'll see it again. Here comes light from out here. There it comes, hits rhodopsin, talks to this, talks to that and closes down. So this is the way in which a single photon of light can turn off the electricity around your plasma membranes and send an impulse to your brain. And it works the same for the cones. Rhodopsin in your eye triggers about once in 10 to the 4 years, which means it's a very low noise device. Most electrical devices are plagued by noise, but rhodopsin is a very uh, stable and faithful reproducer of the signal coming in. We're also detecting just one of these photons, just one, which is also very high sensitivity. But now, this is the clever bit. This is what I think is really clever. I've just shown you this, and this is a kind of slightly more um, uh, expanded view of what I've shown you on that little cartoon. Here is our photon, and one photon is then activating this protein rhodopsin. That's fine, I've shown you that. But this rhodopsin now stays active for long enough not to talk to one transducin molecule, but to talk to a thousand. So one photon has now talked to a thousand other molecules. Let's imagine a relay race. You're running up with your baton. And you don't give it to one person, but a thousand people start running. That's pretty interesting. And this is happening very quickly. Even more so, the next protein in this cascade, a thousand of those for each one of these gets activated. So one photon finishes up as a million events in about less than a millionth of a second. And that's happening at your, in your eye all the time. I think that's pretty spectacular kind of amplification in that kind of speed in a biological situation. And indeed, all of these other drug receptors that I've mentioned to you, they work in much the same kind of way, and it's called an amplification cascade. And that was realized probably around 12, 13 years ago that that's how these other neurological receptors work. So one photon is amplified to 10 to the 6 events in less than 10 to the minus 6th of a second. So what's man done? How far have we got? Have we been any good at all this? And can we repeat that in any sense or form? Well, this is actually where I had to mug up a little bit because I'm no expert and I hope there are no electrical engineers or physicists in the audience. But when I looked around for photocell sizes, typically the photocell uh, size of a detecting part of a photocell, and often germanium or silicon, is typically the order of 10 microns, maybe a bit long, larger than that. Light hits this material, it separates electrical charges, you send it through an amplifier, and then you record an image, much like is happening in our eye. There is one major problem here, and that is that these detector devices can just detect whether there's light or not. None of them can detect color. It's either light or not. They have a sensitivity to different wavelengths, but you cannot get color sensitivity through these devices. The quantum efficiency is somewhere around 5%, 20%. For bacteriodopsin, I told you, it's over 60%. So capturing it is an efficiency problem that we've not managed to meet yet. And I'll show you a, 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 another example in a second. Also, the time scale for some of these interactions is not fast. So this is what the back of your digital camera looks like. Here's a tree, here's a lens, and here is the image processor. And the way we solve this is by putting color filters in front of our uh, detectors. So one will detect green because it's got a little green filter, one will red, one will blue, and then the processor puts all that back together to give you your image. So this is typically what would happen in a digital camera. And here's one of those uh, kind of digital detector cells. And this is the size that typically you have the element within this that's detecting light. Okay, so we're in the micron range, we're in the millionth of a meter range. This was a recent patent I found. It's a photodiode circuit with improved response time. In electronics, you often get 
one parameter optimized, but you have to give way to another. And in this case, the responses that we're getting, and this is a response curve, are typically in the tens, hundreds of nanoseconds to microseconds, but because you've got fast response, you've got very low efficiency, just 7%. You can get higher efficiency, but then your response time goes down. So we're fighting hard to try and get better and better photo devices, man-made devices that can work anywhere close to the, to the, to the kind of uh, efficiency uh, of, man, of uh, the eye. And there are lots of different kinds, the charge couple devices and some of these uh, quantum dot met, um, uh, methods and, and, and so on. And here is, here is, is actually a quantum dot um, a device. It's never been made. It's fantasy at the moment. And these are just individual quantum dot spins that Toshiba say they should be able to mani uh, manufacture. It's not been done, as I said. And what they're trying to do is look at these individual atoms here and irradiate atoms. And then the problem is getting the current to move out of this and pull out the signal. But this is a nanoscale single photon detector device, which is still fantasy in uh, the world out there. And they say they can get about 1% quantum efficiency. Your eye is 70 to 80% efficient. Even the bacterium is at, more, at least 60% efficient. So life and nature has done a much better job than we can yet. So let's compare this. Uh, let's compare nature with man. I've shown you that the eye is sensitive to just a few photons. If you're looking at a very distant star at night, you will be detecting just one or two photons in your retina. Some of these devices, single photon capture devices, are now getting down to somewhere close to that within the last uh, couple of three years. Noise with visual detection is insignificant. You don't get noise in vision. But within any man-made device, it's a considerable and a major problem that we need to overcome. Photodetector size, the proteins I'm talking to you about are about 3,000 millionths of a meter across, three nanometers. These are to the order of several, uh, a thousand, two thousand times bigger. And we aren't able yet to go down to that scale. So already the sensitivity, the acuity of your eyes is far greater by a factor of about 6,000 compared to man-made devices. And so we've got a long way to go to get to those detector sizes. Even if we could, we have to plug into them in some way and that would be a problem. Quantum efficiency, how much we pick up the light and use it energetically is very high in nature. But in these devices, we have trade-offs, and sometimes we can get it higher, but if we do, then the response goes down and it's slower. I mentioned to you that the rods in your eye will be dropping off during this uh, lecture. I also mentioned about blindness and how you can get uh, blind by a very high intensity. But the dynamic range of the eye is anything from 10 million to a billion. It's been, it's been worked out and calculated. Uh, and it can be anything from one to a billion times in dynamic range. That's a huge range of brightness from extremely bright to very dim. The best we can do with any man-made device is 100 to 1. That's the best we can do. So the dynamic range in biology is huge, and we have developed that. This would correspond to about 24 f-stops on your camera, rather than about 6, which is typically what we have now. The amplification is about 60 decibels in power. We are amplifying one photon 10 to the 6 times. The best power amplifiers we have made are about 45 decibels for high power amplifiers uh, without uh, any serious complications. In nature, we can discriminate color, as I've shown you. But no man-made device yet can, dis can discriminate color without filters. And that is a challenge. And then the initial responses in your eye and in the archaea are typically the order of the femtoseconds, picoseconds, one twelve zeroth of a second, whereas nanoseconds is the fastest we can get. So we're still looking at three orders of magnitude in terms of differences. You probably guess now that people have looked at these proteins to try and put them into devices, so-called bio-nanotechnology devices, and certainly we're involved in that. So is there a potential to exploit this technology from nature and put it into something useful for us? High quality detectors, imaging devices, imaging plates um, to try and improve images and so on. Well, a differential electrical response to illumination of uh, just patches of this membrane from the purple bacterium were put into wells, hooked up to uh, an electronic device, and a whole uh, kind of 
uh, lots and lots of bacterial membranes were put into these systems and shown that certainly it's possible to get some kind of uh, electrical response. The limiting factor here, though, was the size of the well that you can produce. And this just happened to be 16 wells that they used in this kind of device. One thing that uh, Olivia is doing, who did come to the audience and didn't go to the conference in Bordeaux, she's French, um, is to take a single molecule of bacteriodopsin and use that as a photodetector. Three nanometers in size, rather than the microns, tens of microns we have in our own photocells. And she's been at it about two and a half years, and you can talk to her later whether she thinks she's successful or not, but she has done it several times now, and this is an amazing breakthrough. No one's ever done that before. So working on that particular system, we're now coupling into single molecules. So we're getting there. This is from Defense Horizons. This is the US Defense Organization. It's a, universe, well, it's a, it's a research establishment which sets out a, sends out a news, newsletter on a regular basis, so you can look at it on the web. And about six years ago, they said that bacteriodopsin has holographic properties which can be used to create biological three-dimensional memory and situation awareness devices. The military are looking to these proteins to make sensitive devices for light detection. One such prototype device will give about 10, 7 to 10 gigabytes of digital data on the size of that test tube that's passing around and you've looked at. Okay? And compare that to a hard disk in a computer. You can see that if you can concentrate that up, you could probably do that kind of uh, memory device construction. And indeed, this protein, um, sorry, bacteriodopsin, that they've said here, um, with, capable of withstanding virtually any environmental abuse. That protein you have in your hands, because it's an extremophile, comes from environments in which you can change salt concentration, you can change the acidity and alkalinity, and you can even take it up to very high temperature and it's extremely stable. So it solves one of the major problems of bio technology of robustness. And so that is one of the suggestions. And one of my colleagues at the University of Connecticut, he is funded to the level of around $3 million a year to run a huge research program on just doing this. Not easy to get the UK to fund that, I assure you. So because it's going around in this cycle, you can also tune the retinal to different colors. You can actually grow the bacterium under different colors. I showed you the salt reclamation beds. They're different colors. You can grow it in any of these colors you like because the environment around the protein is pre-selected by the light. So can it be used as a single molecule detector? As I said, Olivia is trying that. And here is a, a setup, an electrical setup, where they're trying to use it as a, a, a branch photocycle memory device hooked up to optics and electrical device. So a lot of money is going into this. Why? Image detection and processing, artificial retina, and people are having photo detectors, but if you could do a, a, a really high resolution one, you could start to help people who have sight difficulties, and this indeed is being worked on, data storage, and so on. Here is a device that has been created using light and putting light sensitivity into a bacterium. By putting the bacteriodopsin into a bacterium, making it express it, signaling it down a signaling pathway, and then making it swim in response to light. This has been constructed by a lab in, in Germany, in Munich. So what's going to happen is that light is going to hit this protein, and then we're going to trigger a set of reactions, and the bacterium will start swimming. There it goes, hits the flagellar motor, and the bacterium starts swimming. You can engineer this kind of thing if you want to. So you can turn bacteria on and off, and if they were in some kind of biodegradation environment or so, then you can start to use it at will. So my uh, last slide is just to kind of uh, summarize what we've learned from nature. Molecular events occur at the nanoscale. It's probably no surprise to you, but also not only in time, but also structurally. And these are controlling everything we do. We're controlling our actions. Fast, high efficient, noise-free electronic interactions occur in nature. And these light detection signal amplification are far, at, uh, uh, far and away ahead of what man has been able to do so far. Electronic changes can be converted into mechanical work. And that's quite difficult for us to see light and think it might convert into something uh, mechanical to do work. Color detection has evolved in nature. The retinals can be tuned to different colors. We need to be able to do that in some way in a man-made environment. And archaea have adapted to be very stable 
And so this could well be um, useful in devices. And thank you to all those people over the last 35 years that have worked with me. And they've gone from people all over the world, from Russia, South America, uh, Germany, where I worked for five years, the States. And it's been a very exciting field. And it's still developing. And I hope in the next few years of my active life, I'll be able to see it develop even further. And thank you for your attention.